And, and uh, am I in frame? Is this okay? All right, cool. If I talk this loud, can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Am I talking too fast? Because I am that nervous, <laughs> so I just want to check. All right, good time. So, yep, start laughing now. The jokes don't get better. All right, <laughs> thank, thank you. All right, so like I said, um, my name is Evan Simpson, and the top of my talk, you can read it right there. Life is not a Kaggle competition. I'm inspired by the uh, I'm inspired by the German phrase. I think it's "Das Leben ist kein Ponyhof." Is that right? Thank you. <laughs> okay, and that means life is not a pony show. And that roughly translates to things do not work basically the way you want them to. It's not perfect, things don't line up correctly. Is that right? About right? All right, cool. I'm getting nods of approval, we're good. So this is the general talk that we're going to be doing today. There we go, three parts, introduction, use cases, and conclusions. And with that, let me introduce myself again. As I said, my name is Evan Simpson and long, long, long time ago, I was an English language teacher in South Korea. Yeah, that's me. Okay, so I, I am, don't have, a, that's, a something, that's something I probably should have mentioned a minute ago. Um, I don't have a CS background. I graduated with a degree in literature. And then I decided to separate myself from all the other Americans with a 3.0 GPA in literature. And I decided to go teach English abroad. And while I was teaching English in South Korea, I absolutely fell in love with teaching. So, but I was really, really, really annoyed because I saw all my best students doing the worst on all their exams. And that bothered me. That disconnect really bothered me. So I decided to go to graduate school and learn all about teaching. And then I decided to go and do a PhD and learn a lot about language assessment, which is, a fancy word for applied statistics. And then of course once you start getting into once you start getting into applied statistics, well you get into data science and machine learning and the PhD wasn't quite agreeing with me and I wasn't agreeing with it. So I went back to Asia and I got a job where I traveled all over East Asia doing assessment literacy workshops, which is a fancy word for you're teaching this, you're testing this do you not see how those are different? Thank you. And so basically I would do it was doing these types of workshops and I was explaining to people all of this using statistics and a little bit of data science, but a lot of statistics and I got really into natural language processing. And so, you know, my wife and I, we were in Shanghai and we just got so tired of wearing those N95 pollution masks. So on January 1st, 2020, we decided we were going to move to Berlin. And that's when I ended up doing a data science boot camp. And like I said, my background's in English language teaching and literature. So I wanted to answer the question, how old do you need to be to read a certain book? As in how mature do you need to be? Because for example, this is a fun one. Which book has, is uh, more difficult to read um, as far as like language complexity? Fifty Shades of Grey or Harry Potter? Shout it out. Harry Potter. Harry Potter actually is more different, has more complex language than Fifty Shades of Grey. Now that's an obvious example, we all know that, but imagine you don't. There's this book, it's got this random cover, you don't know what's in it, are you gonna recommend it to your students? What are you gonna recommend? How are you going to make that recommendation? So, I created a program that would read the metadata and actually tell you this is, I've created a machine learning uh, uh, op, machine learning program that used the metadata to identify how old someone needs to be to read a book within, this, within uh, the mean absolute error of one year. So it's like 15, 14, 15, 16, close enough. People loved it. Okay, and also I, I couldn't help it. I also did the computer vision thing of can you judge a book by its cover? The answer is yes, but you can judge it much better if you actually know what's in the book. Anyway, so, <laughs> shocker, right? Anyway, so then after that, you know, like that was basically me and I did the machine learning boot camp, and I got really into data science, but you know, like I said, January 1st, 2020, COVID, no one was hiring, so, it then became the thing of like, I want to keep working on machine learning and I need more data. 
because I need data to do projects, because you can't do machine learning without data. And so people said, use Kaggle. How many of you here have used Kaggle? Raise your hand. OK, good. How many of you, I have no idea what Kaggle is. This was an oversight on my part. OK, so very quickly, what Kaggle is, is it is a website where people can go to and they have competitions uh, to say, here's a data set. Make the best predictions you can based on this data set. And they have competitions and it's for ranking points and everything like that. It's really good if you want to learn how to do data science. However, life is not a Kaggle competition in that you are not normally given data to work with. It's up to you to go get the data in order to then answer your question. And that brings me to my next thing, which is this. This is this beautiful thing that you see all over the place where it's like, here's all this data. And then, oh, can you sort it, arrange it? Can you present it for us? Can you tell a story with the data? Can you do this amazing stuff? And everyone focuses on steps two through six. And everyone seems to forget about step one, which is to do anything else, you need the data. And where do you get the data? Well, that's someone else's job. Well, if you're working at a startup or any other small organization, or you have an idea you want to, you want to explore, you need to get the data. And so how do you actually get it? Well, there's a few ways. And one of the big problems a lot of times with getting data that people say, there's usually like three big problems that people have with data. One is that they get too much of it. And they say it's like drinking from a fire hose. Now, does anyone here use uh, sensors to collect data? Anyone? No, yeah, one person, all right, cool. I've heard that people say that the, one of the problems is they just get way too much of it to process. Is that right? I have the one person nodding, we're good. All right, cool, <laughs> thank you. So that's one problem that people talk about. Another, people pro blah, 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 another problem people discuss is this, that the data is too dirty. It is, and they, this is where you get that adage that 80% of the time of data scientists is spent cleaning and sorting data and getting it in a shape that they can use to work on it. Both of those are problems, but in my opinion, this is the worst problem to have. And that's having no data and having nothing because you can have the fanciest model in the world, but if you don't have any data, it's useless. Same thing, you can make a wonderful uh, ML uh, ops uh, uh, product, but unless you're ingesting new data, your drift is going to then lead into decay and it's all going to fall apart. So you have to have a constant stream of data. Anytime you have a data drought, everything dies. And so what I want to talk to you all about is some of the different use cases I've had where I've gone through and the question is always, where do you get the data? And so now I'm going to tell you a few different use cases. Use case number one, like I said, I just finished my boot camp and I wanted to use all these wonderful skills I had learned, but no one was hiring. And so I was able to find this organization called Omdena. Anyone heard of Omdena? Nope, cool. <sighs> Fantastic. So what Omdena is, is it is this wonderful, wonderful program in, uh, that's based, uh, I can't remember the man who started it. If I remember right, he's from India and he now lives in the UK. I can't quite remember but it's a program, it's AI for good. And the whole idea is that they do two month challenges where they say, we're gonna gather AI practitioners, machine learning practitioners, you volunteer for two months, please commit five to 15 hours a week solving a problem. And what's the problem that we were given to solve? That. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got two months, knock it out. And we're like, what? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, this is gonna be an NLP, natural language processing problem, maybe some computer vision. We'll see what you guys can come up with. And we just kinda like, and it's all these people zooming in from Latin America, North Africa, Europe, East Asia, South Asia, just staring into the screen going, what? And so they start throwing out some different ideas of like where we could go to find data. And what, of course, young people, what do young people use? Twitter. Say again, I heard Twitter, Twitter. TikTok, 
Instagram, exactly, social media, yay! So the idea is there's all these different social media sites and they're great because young people are on them and they're posting. Now, of course, you get the, th the real question of like, what about the people who don't use social media? And that's called selection bias in statistics, if I remember right. But the point being though is, okay, with the caveat of the people that are using social media, we can start looking at some of their different sentiments. Okay, just put that out there right away. So we can just go ahead and uh, get the data off there, right? It's easy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all chuckle for a reason. And um, uh, Emiliano was doing a great job earlier about talking about APIs, API calls, call in, and then get the data from the uh, different social media sites, right? Because they just give that away freely, right? <laughs> well, yeah, they do, depending on the situation and depending on your license, and depending on this, and depending on that, and if you apply, it might take this long, or it might take that long, and we're like, we're in a hurry. <laughs> we have two months before we need to wrap up the project, have a finished product, have a finished product, and submit it. So we need to move now, right now. And so what we ended up doing was doing a really big question and asking ourselves this. This gentleman right here, love this guy, his name's Alan Maley absolute hero in English language teaching. And he says this, and it's so true. Because you do not want to be a hammer looking for a nail. You want to say, okay, this is the problem. What can we use to solve it? And that's the thing. We just immediately start looking around it because people kept saying, oh, well, the official Twitter API takes this long to apply for. The Instagram API takes this long. TikTok takes this long. And everything has a different application process. And, that, 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 that. and it's like, well, do we need all that functionality? What's the minimal functionality we need in order to achieve the task that we want? And that's the right tool. And for us, in that situation, it was SN. S scrape. I always say that wrong. SN scrape. <laughs> I always add an extra S. But yeah, SN scrape, which is called social network scrape. And what it is, is it is a it is a um, it is a tool that you can download off of GitHub and you, you run it in Python. It's a command line interface and it works like that. And so what it allows you to do is it allows you to take uh, social media data. And what I, when I say social media, I mean social media. So for example here, how many, how many people know all of these? No one, really? No, no, I thought maybe one person would know. All right, cool. So who can help me out here? What's this? Thank you. Okay, good. Where is it based? Moscow. Ex exactly, yeah. This, this is a very popular Russian social network site. And this one, everyone? Good job. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. Alternate, easy and difficult, good. This one? Weibo? Yeah, exactly. This, uh, did you say Weibo? Yeah, yeah this uh, Chinese, Weibo. But yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but yeah, this is, this is Weibo. This, is, this has like more users than like any other like social media site in the world. Possibly TikTok's now overtaken it because now TikTok has gone global, whereas Weibo is still only in China. And it is huge. But the, the point though here is, and you all know Reddit, um, Instagram, Telegram, you get the idea. All of the, you can scrape all of these different sites using this one library. And so that's why we said this is going to be our jam. And so we used it and we, whoop, come back. Thank you. And so we, this is how we used it. Very simple, we, we were scraping hashtags off of Twitter, we were scraping also locations, uh, sorry, searches, and then same thing, you can see it here, it's command line tool, it's dead simple. And so we used this in order to collect our data. It was, this was one data source from social media. We also did some other things as well that I won't get into, but the general point is this, within a few weeks, we'd collected our data, that was my job, and I was able to then pass it off to the analysts, the people who use Tableau, and the people who were going to write up the report, and we were able to complete it within time. And that was the whole thing of, if we would have waited, and we would have actually tried to get the official APIs, we never would have been able to get all of them in time in order to then collect the data, in order to then do uh, the research that we needed. And so that's use case number one. Use case number two. Um, my wife, 
Deborah Stephanie Fuccio, also Steph Fuccio, she created this wonderful thing called Pod Rev Day. It's a hashtag on Twitter, and what it was used for, um, it was a one-year thing that she did, one-year project, whereby what she did was she helped to uh, she helped listeners review podcasts on one day of the month every month. And the whole point is this. These were the steps involved. Very, very simple. All she wanted was for listeners to promote podcasts. Simple, right? Cool. Now, something that um, Emiliano was talking about earlier about like, um, what was it? It was a validation. Does it, is it actually working? Because <laughs> that was the question. Like she said, she sent this out to people and it was like, are people actually doing it? And the only way to check that is to actually then search for the hashtag. So once again, now uh, it's a great line from, uh, I think it's Isaac Asimov, The Age of Eternity, if I remember right. It's computers do not learn better than humans, just faster. And it's that thing, like if you wanted to, you could go on Twitter, you could search hashtag pod rev day, and you could count each individual one. Knock yourself out. Let me know how that works. Or what I did was I used, um, once again, SNN Scrape to download every single example of people using the hashtag pod rev day. And these are the statistics. And once again, also I used the user data too. So once again, who used it and then find out the information about that person using SNM, using the library. <laughs> yeah, I, I give up. <laughs> okay, so then once again, using the library, I was able to come up with this information. And once then here's the thing I forgot to mention. Why was getting this information important? Because once she had it, she was then able to attract sponsors. Because the whole thing was, are people actually using it? You've created this hashtag, you've created this movement, you did a great presentation telling everyone about it. Cool. Is anyone actually doing it? Yes, they are. Where are they doing it? On Twitter? Yeah, but where are they? And it's like, okay, well, I was able to go on there and I was able to find out where these people were in the world within reason. We'll get to that later. So that's another instance where this was able to play a great role. Now, Imagine you have a question. Now this gets back to the idea of like startups. And um, uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, next week the AI Guild will be releasing uh, an article about um, lessons learned on creating teams for uh, putting uh, models into production. And um, one of the key tenets was create a proof of concept as quick as possible. Do not, yeah, do not spend a year doing a research project because what? One of the big problems is a lot of people in data science and machine learning are highly, highly educated and they're used to doing really long studies. Sometimes you need to move fast, don't break things, but you do need to move a little bit quick with your study. And so that's the idea of coming up with a proof of concept as quick as possible. So getting to that point, imagine you're building, some, you're in your group, you have an idea and you're like, okay, well, we need to create this. We have an idea. Now, how do we get the data to actually test that idea? Okay, here's an idea. I wonder if there's anyone that uses Twitter and when they tweet, it moves the market. Well, maybe if when they do tweet and it moves the market, if we could time that person's tweet and invest appropriately, we'd be able to make bank. This is all hypothetical, okay? Once again, literature major. Do not take my financial advice, okay? We good? We good, thank you. Cool, so for example, so this is the idea. This is the idea we have, cool, how can we test it? Well, the first thing we need to do is get the data because we're not gonna argue about, we're not gonna have a debate about whether or not it's a good idea. We're gonna actually put it in, we're gonna get a proof of concept and we're gonna test it as quickly as possible. All right, well, imagine this guy. He has quite the Twitter following when he talks about different types of coins, things happen. Okay, cool. Well, what if we got his tweets and we actually, we actually went through and we paired it up with the mo movement of stock prices or crypto and we could actually see what the reflect, is there a correlation at all? Just an idea. Okay, I know someone else has already done it, but anyway, you get the idea. So, okay, well, how do we do that? Well, let's go get his tweets. Okay, not a problem. Click. Thank you. So this is this is the code. This is how you actually do it using SN scrape. Okay, <laughs> using okay. this actually works. Okay, this is all it takes. And so you you once again you would pip install 
the library and then you would run this command in your terminal and it will actually output you a JSON file of all of his tweets that he's ever done from the beginning until now. Okay? Now bear something in mind. He, if you look all the way up there in the upper left hand corner, it might be a bit too small, but he has done quite a few tweets. So therefore, you might want to start setting some limits. And that's where this library comes in really handy because you can say, all right, fine, give me the last hundred. So you just insert that one little line, that, that's just that one more argument. And you just start altering these arguments. And you can do tons of different arguments. You can do time, you can do place. You can, so you can pick a specific day and you can uh, pick a certain week, reach back in time, and this way you get around some of the obstacles that you have when you use the official Twitter API, which won't let you actually go back in time that far, or will only let you get 3,200 tweets of somebody. These are your workarounds. Now, something I really forgot to mention at the beginning is this. All of this is public information. You are not going in and grabbing anyone's DMs. That's a big difference because when you use the Twitter API and you use your credentials, you can actually send messages and get DMs from that account. With this, it's not. You're just taking what's on the front page of Twitter or Reddit or uh, Mastodon or Telegram or whatever you're using. It forgot to mention that. Cool. So then moving on. The question then always becomes that people go, well, how do I know what's possible? How do I know what I can search for? You do the Twitter advanced search and you start typing everything in and that will actually tell you the different search parameters you can use. So just FYI. Then this is what comes back to you. Needless to say, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot. A lot of it's not useful. But, most, but the th key things that are useful are things like this. And so you can just very quickly download what you want and then start using pandas or whatever, load this into pandas and do whatever you need to do. Okay. One thing that's very important to notice though, is that word, last one there, place, location, if any, because a lot of people, when they start doing place, oh, this is like the most common place on Twitter. Say again. In where? Oh, good to know. <laughs> okay, because like the most of the ones that, that I've seen, it's that, it's blank, it's nothing. <laughs> it's absolutely nothing. No one puts a location. That's like the most common one for, and then after that, people, they just start having fun. They do Mars or the moon, or they do, like you said, Middle Earth, or they have a lot of fun, and they say on the back of a dragon. So, you know, like you have to take all this with a serious grain of salt. Now, speaking of that, one of the huge limitations of this library is the fact that uh, it's that thing that you mentioned earlier about like Linux that I love. People say, you know, like Linux is free if you don't value your time. <laughs> uh huh. And it's like same thing with like uh, with this library, SN Scrape. I think I finally got it that time. Um, one of the big problems is it is open source and it's someone, it's a group, it's a team, it's their project. Their documentation is horrific, <laughs> like next level horrific. You need to dive into the code and like really try to work out what's there. I've put together a list of different articles of people who have used it for different purposes and I've put together a medium list. I'll share it with you all at the end because that's the best documentation I've found for it because otherwise it's just pure dive into the code. So if you're looking for an open source project, remember not all heroes wear capes, you can write documentation. And I'm part of me, yeah, so I, I recommend that. The other thing that it won't let you do is that you can't see, it tells you the number of people someone's following, it tells you the number of people that they're following, but it doesn't tell you who they're following. It also doesn't tell you who's following them. Now, that's a limitation for me and my wife for our project that we have, which is called Engagement Bunny Hop Pop. And what that is, is what it is, is the idea, and we've been using this with podcasters, um, what it is is like, who is a, what is a podcast whose listenership you would like to engage with and you would like to bring over to your podcast? This works for any content creator. 
So who is, who is a content creator in your field that you're trying to attract? And then based on that, we were able to take the, we were able to take their Twitter followers and provide and based on our algorithm that we came up with, identify the top 100 that we think you should engage with, as well as the engagement strategies that you can use. This works really, really well using the official Twitter API. It won't work using um, SN Scrape because that information is not available. So once again, right tool, right job. Like I said, Tweepy, official Twitter API, very easy to use, <sighs> within reason, depending on things. So then finally, if you want to get more information, like I said, I'll share a copy of my slides with you all. And it has uh, the links, and all the links will be hot in the PDF, so go ahead and use them. And then moving on from there, um, like I mentioned, next week, a little bit of log roll. Uh, next, I've just become the editor of the AI Guild's um, uh, Deploy It Already newsletter. And what that's all about is putting, putting uh, machine learning use cases, in, blah, 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 putting machine learning models into production. So all of the, everything you'll see in this newsletter is all about this was our situation, these were the problems we faced, this is how we overcame them, and now this is how it's going to production. We have people from Get Your Guide and Zalando, they're, they're going to be publishing in it, and you'll recognize other people as well. And then finally, the last thing I just want to say in summary, again, Das Leben ist kein Ponyhof. Also, use the right tool for the right job. Remember, in the real world, most of the time you have to go get the data yourself especially for your own pet project. And same thing, make sure that, you know, like SN Scrape works great for some things, it doesn't work great for everything. Sometimes you don't need the official API, just use the right tool to solve your problem. And with that, thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank you, Evan. You're very uh, welcome. Do we have questions? I have not dug that much under the hood to find out, but I am about 99.99% positive that yes, it would spin up a, like either Scrapey or Selenium or some kind of web driver and then just, and just crawl. Because uh, one person, one of the things that they wanted to see was um, what were all the tweets using the MAGA hashtag, make America great again, uh, the MAGA hashtag on January 6th the day of the insurrection, because they wanted to see the sentiment of the tweets that were, yeah. yeah. And it's just like, okay, I don't know how you'd actually do that. But, but sure enough, that's, and so it just did that. And it uses, if I remember right, it just spins up. Yeah, I'm rambling, I realize. <laughs> I, if I remember right, it, it's, I'm pretty sure it spins up a web driver, but I would have to look it up and tell you for sure. It's in their doc, it's not in their documentation, but it's the in code. their, you have to read the source code. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, and it just tells you very, they tell you right away, like this is all written in Python. There are Python modules. They're not documented. So you can, you can pip install and then import social network scraper as SNS and then use the different Python modules, but it's not documented anywhere where they are or what they are. You just have to look it up. I didn't. Um, what I did was I asked, um, I asked um, the original Google, a librarian, I asked her, I uh, was like, okay, so is there a database of, uh, that, have, that are really trusted age recommendations for different book, for books? And she mentioned two, one was EBSCO, the other one was Common Sense Media. EBSCO was behind a paywall, so that wasn't work. Uh, Common Sense Media at the time was not behind a paywall, so I asked them if I, could get a if I could have access to their API. They took too long, so I used Beautiful Soup, and I, sc I scraped it using Beautiful Soup. And then the way I validated the data was, 
I was a literature major, and at that point I had taught English to, the joke is I've taught K to gray. So kindergarten kids all the way up to really old people. And so the joke was, the, sorry, what I did was I just looked at a few recommendations and I went, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that one, eh, close enough. And I just validated the data myself that way using my own dom domain experience. questions I you know my question is how do you think what's your vision for the future if many people like you start doing this kind of questions or this kind of mechanism okay so if I understand you correctly um, what you're asking is what's going to happen when the field of digital humanities expands further and I think at that point, well, it'll be beautiful because you'll stop hearing people be proud of being a Luddite and people that are proud to be, you know, like tech phobic and say, I, I, I don't do math. And it's like, I, I, I never studied math. And then I got into statistics because I cared about language teaching and about language testing. And the whole thing is like, once people realize the application of these tools, then they'll stop being afraid, they'll start putting them into use. Uh, like I was chatting with someone earlier, if you actually teach it better, people won't be so afraid, people will actually start using it, and they'll start putting it into practice, and they'll be able to, like you said, they'll be able to bring their domain experience and wed it to this, these tech tools in order to create some really cool stuff. And they'll be able to interact and liaise with people. And then, then you won't have, you know, like the tech people over here talking and the lit people or the art people over here just kind of like side-eyeing each other. They'll actually be able to discuss and like uh, um, uh, 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 collaborate on different, tech, uh, on different skills. Because like I, when, I, when, I was on, when I did my boot camp, needless to say I was the only humanities person and everyone else was in either engineering or math. <laughs> but it's like I was able to ask people for technical help and then when it came of course when it came time for like what about this what about that we were able to like you know I was able to ask them questions to probe them and get them to think deeper about the project and answer the the and do the true first step of every machine learning project which is answer this question what is the problem we're trying to solve? <laughs> it's like once you can really answer that you're you're well on your way until you're doing that you're just like eh, we're just you know throwing stuff at the wall Thank you. you're welcome Say that one more time. Did you think about creating a product? We have created a product for that. And we are currently selling that product. It's called Engagement Bunny Hop Hop. Yeah, and um, yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is it right. There we go. Nope. <laughs> yep, there we go. So yeah, so this is the idea. Yeah, it's engagement bunny, and yeah, we we use this, and we we've promoted this to different independent podcasters and uh, content creators, as and it's yeah, and as I always tell them, you could do this yourself. Knock yourself out. Go look, find this Twitter following of you know 110,000 people, mm -hmm, and go and sort through all of them and pick a hundred that you think you're going to click with. Let me know how that works, and that's just. That's the whole thing. It's like, once again, computers don't learn better than humans, just faster. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you break this, for example, here or any other social media, how do you know this is still files or not for bots? I don't. You don't. No, I. Maybe there's a, like a false intention with files that have been bought and it's really real followers. Maybe they're kind of trying to get you to no because we don't we, that's one of the first that's and this gets me back to my original thing which is like who's the audience you want to attract and so we never we never do like a false influencer because they'll pick like a podcast that they love and they know that this podcast is real it's a real twitter account that so that like when we're finding an account to then uh, to then take those followers from and give them to somebody that account is legit Yes. Is, is, is it the bot that they're analyzing? Is it the actual trait? 
Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first use case was ohm data, and what we were doing in that situation most of the time was we were doing hashtag searches. So, for example, we had we had people that were Portuguese and Spanish speakers and English speakers, and they said and they talked to their younger brothers, sisters, cousins, and it was like, hey, what are the hashtags you guys are using? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we had to go to the youth to like get the information from them, and so then we were we were searching for those hashtags. And then we collected all of that data and we aggregated all of that data. So it could have been, you're right, now I was in the data collection stage. I don't then know if anyone passed it off to the next group who were cleaning it before they were, before they were then modeling it. I have a feeling that someone may have done that. They may have gone through, but that's, that's, a, that's, um, uh, that's beyond the scope of what I know. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, the thing that I remember, because now I remember why I brought up that up with uh, the Make America Great Again MAGA hashtag search. It was, um, uh, it when scraping every single tweet on that one day, it took three and a half minutes to download them all on my computer. So yeah, it's definitely spinning up and it, and it grabbed a couple of thousand. And so when I use the official Twitter API, it can grab, I want to say it'll grab like 15,000 in an hour, but that's because it's rate limiting you. So it's, it, like you said, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it is spinning up a web driver and it's going very slowly with Selenium and it's just crawling the page like a human going like next 50, next 50, next 50, because uh, it shouldn't take it that long to get that few. That's if I remember off the top of my head. And now I remember why I brought that up. <laughs> Thank you.